<laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right, apparently, all it is, is just press record. Are we recording yeah. now? We are now live. Uh, Spot on. So, thank you to coming to the Big Week show. Here we have the MP Carl Turner, who's nicely joined us. So, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Josh. I'm Carl Turner. I'm the Labour Member of Parliament for East Hull. Um, currently a backbench Labour MP in Parliament, but a member of the Justice Select Committee, which is incredibly interesting to me because I'm very keen on legal aid and the access to justice for everybody, not just the few. No, nice, nice. So we'll dive straight into like your, your past lives, starting from like obviously your school life and um, the drama when you was younger and stuff like that. Can you just uh, tell me like what was you interested when you was like younger and stuff like what hobbies was you into? Well, I suppose um, I mean like most kids really, born and bred in Hull, I was interested in rugby league. That was my sport of choice. I used to think I was good at it, but it later transpired that I wasn't that very good at it really. Certainly not good enough to be professional at the sport, but I was very interested as a kid. Played rugby league at my uh, secondary school and played amateur rugby league up to being about 14. Um, But yeah, I mean, most of the things that you would expect to interest a kid from East Hull, a working class kid who went to Brands O'Mai, I'd be interested in, and not all all of it was sort of what you would... uh, what... what, um, you would want to advocate for for kids nowadays. Really, it was just the reality of being brought up on a council estate. Is the truth? I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I went to school at Bransome High. I left school at sixteen without any qualifications at all. Yeah, right. Um, I suppose partly let down by education, but let down by myself probably. Actually, I now sort of look back and reflect on my education and think, Christ, what was I doing? Uh, why was I wasting my time? And I should have been getting stuck in a lot earlier. But the reality was, I think, during that period of a long Tory government, if kids were, didn't seem to have the ability, they were just left to fail, is the truth of it. Mm. And we got the Labour government post-1997, which emphasised education and lifelong learning actually, and that's when I sort of got an interest in education with the lifelong learning agenda of the Labour Party, which sort of gave me the confidence and encouragement to go off to college where I did A-levels and uh, surprised myself really at A-levels, getting A-grades and then going on to the University of Hull to do a law degree and then to qualify as a barrister and briefly practising as a lawyer before I went into Parliament in 2010. Oh, wow. So it was swimming through quite a lot then. So going like, back into the school, like you are saying, like you didn't get no grades and stuff, what was the mindset through it? Was you like hanging around with the wrong group? Was it just a bit of like, weren't really interested in the topics? Well, look, I don't think I was a sort of a, you know, kid who was always in trouble particularly, but I would, you know, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't academic and I don't think I was encouraged. I don't blame teachers either, really, at Brands oh My, because some of the teachers were incredibly committed. A bloke who was impressive to me is a guy called Keith Sinclair. He was a, an economics teacher at uh, Brands oh My. And, you know, he, you know he, he would try and encourage. But actually... If you go through your education and it's not been impressive, it's not been good, you know, it's hard to get into that mindset, I think, as a kid, yeah. where you want to actually get stuck in and study and, and achieve, uh, and then you leave school and realise, you know, I've, I've missed a chance, really. But as I say, it's never too late, um, really, because I went off to Hull College when I was about 23, I think, and did the A-levels and then went on to university and did well at university and qualified as a barrister uh, as a result of getting stuck in and, and achieving academically. But, you know, I remember my careers teacher um, having a meeting with me when I was probably about, I think they saw you when you were about 13, it's the first year of secondary school in them days. And I remember saying that um, I quite fancied being a lawyer 
and um, the response from her, probably rightly looking at my academic ability at that point, was a complete hilarity. She was just thinking it was hilarious that I would suggest such a mm. such a thing, and she sort of I don't really knock her. I suppose I look back at it. I think you know, no wonder probably, but actually. The mindset, I think, for... This does sound critical, actually, but, you know, she was expecting me to be preparing myself to be factory fodder, if I can put it mm. like that, you know, somebody who's not going to be achieving. And I think it's sad because, you know, um, people should be encouraged. Uh, people should be encouraged to achieve well, and I think there's more emphasis on it now. Um uh, there's certainly more emphasis on sort of encouraging kids into vocational stuff. We've got a brilliant opportunity in Hull with the Ron Deering College, I think. I think if Ron Deering existed when I was a kid, I might have gone into that because I was interested in sort of mechanics. I had a couple of motorbikes as a kid um, and I could have probably got into that. But it was just a definite, you know, you're, you know, you're boxed into working in a factory or in menial work, not people who work in factories, by the way, it's incredibly important for the economy. I just think people should be paid better, frankly. Mm. And the idea of, you know, me wanting to be a lawyer to this careers teacher was hysterical. I think the next thing I said to her was that, I, well, I know the next thing I said to her was, well, well if I can't be a lawyer, I'm going to be an MP. Mm. And that was even more amusing to her. So, you know, that was my experience of uh, of education. But I don't blame anybody. Probably I blame myself a bit, frankly. I don't blame my parents either, by the way, because they were encouraging. They did the best. They sort of worked hard and encouraged us to do well. But, I mean, if you're in that, you know, if you've not got that sort of encouragement at school... Um, it's easy to fail. Mm. What uh, was your parents like when, like, you know, you came out of school and you didn't, didn't get the grades and stuff like that? What were their, what were their like, mindsets with you like? Well, I think my, my mother and father's attitude was, well, he'll, all, he'll always do all right because he's got that sort of personality where he's a bit sort of, you know, you know, I'm not, I, I, I didn't sort of, uh, I wasn't shy, put it that way. And I think they thought I'd do all right. And to be fair, I would, I did really. Um, not just academically eventually, but, you know, when I I went to Australia for a year when I was 18, I got an interest in antiques. Um, I then came back to uh, Hull and dealt in antiques for a f quite a few years. I then went to college and then on to the degree at Hull Uni and then went into a career as a lawyer mm. doing criminal law, representing from chambers later on, prosecuting and defending uh, criminal in the criminal law um, and then into politics which came to me I suppose by chance really I know I'd had this sort of thing where I'd said to a careers teacher many many years before I'm going to be an MP then if I can't be a lawyer um, uh, but it was never really a burning ambition to be a member of parliament John Prescott my predecessor had announced that he was going to be standing down um, and there was a few people locally who'd been in, who showed that they were interested in looking to be selected as the parliamentary candidate for the Labour Party. And I thought, well, why not have a stab at that? Um, I've always had a, an interest in politics. I've always been involved in the Labour Party. Not massively as an activist, I have to be honest, but I would attend meetings and I would be involved and interested in the campaigns that were going on more at local government level rather than nationally. But I put my eye in the ring and was selected quite sort of, you know, with um, with a fairly comfortable majority by the members in East Hull. And it was one of those things, I think, where East Hull was ready, in my view, East Hull Labour Party, and I think the constituency wider, was ready for somebody from East Hull. The reality had been, I think the local press wrote it up, that... I'm the first Member of Parliament to have been selected and then elected, sorry, the candidate to be selected and then Member of Parliament elected, who was actually born and bred in the constituency. I think the local press did a piece in that it's the first local born and bred 
representative since William Wilberforce, and actually that wasn't right because William Wilberforce was the Member of Parliament for the entirety of the region, East Yorkshire, effectively, and he was born in East Yorkshire. Um, and rep- sorry, he was born in Hull actually, but he represented the the bit wider region. I was the first person to be born and bred in the constituency to actually go to Parliament representing the constituency and not knocking my predecessor, John, but he was born in Prestatyn in Wales and he was brought up in Yorkshire in Rotherham when he was, I think, the move to, to Yorkshire when he was about six or seven. His dad worked on the railways and that was the reason why the family moved. But John wasn't born and bred in East Hull, although to be fair to John, he made Hull his home for his family and actually still still lives with his wife uh, in Hull. Oh, well. So if you, so you said like a little bit of a gap from school uh, to when you was 18, when you went to Australia. What did you do from like 16 to like, you know, the 18 where you thought, oh, I'm just going to get on this plane and go to... I was in jail for that period of time. I'm joking. <laughs> it's a joke. No, I, uh, what did I do between 16 and 18? <laughs> so I left school at 16 without a qualification, as I've said, um... I then got into, uh, there was something called the youth training scheme in those days where you sort of did a 12-month period where you get the, I think it was about 23 quid at the time, but then you had to do placements. And the reality was I just couldn't, I just couldn't get, um, I did a few placements. Some of them were good experiences, others less good, mm. if I'm honest. Um, uh, but I did a few of those uh, placements, um Stellar and Ideal, which I thought was a good good placement. I worked out, I think it was uh, Crosley Ferguson then. It's now, uh, well, I, I don't think they exist as a company now, but a builder's merchant as on a placement, but never employed. And it was sort of the, I know we don't want to be political in this podcast thing, but that was the Tory government sort of, you know, we've got kids coming out of school without qualifications. What can we do with them? We can't just put them on the dull queue we've got to give them something and the youth training scheme was a was a program that very rarely worked in the sense that people didn't very often get jobs from it it was employers in my experience would take advantage of the fact that they've got cheap labor um and you would go from placement to placement to placement uh you know there was one occasion where i was at a a particular placement i won't say which because the company still does exist where uh, I was told on day one that my job was going to be making tea and that was it and that was all I was going to be uh, be doing to which I replied about three or four hours after when I'd thought about it look I'm not frankly I'm out to make a cup of tea and uh, you know as long as I'm here it's not going to improve my tea making ability so thanks very much for offering but I'm not going to bother mm. any longer so it didn't last long um as I say, I, let, I did that for a couple of years and then went off to Australia and um, uh, uh, and um, got an interest in antiques. But when I was doing the sort of YTS thing, I was, fortunately for me, and this is why I say it's not all bad, placements were a bit crap, I've got to tell you, but my uh, YTS was with the uh, iTech Centre, which is, it still exists now, I think, but it was a... It, it was a part of the whole city council, so the the quality of the training, the way, you know, it was it was a information technology. The quality of the training was very good. The placements were crap, uh, and that was because, frankly, employers were using uh, were u- using people who were cheap labour to sort of make tea. Really, mm-hmm. I think some people's experience of the YTS went well. I'm sure that people got a job, stayed with the company and prospered very well. But I think the, if I'm honest, I think the the, the percentage of those people who succeeded through that route is probably few and far between. Um, so I, sp- I probably learned a lot. I definitely learned how to get out of bed in the morning and get to work. Um, so that discipline... Uh, and um, uh, life lesson was an important one, I think. Uh, but in terms of actually getting anything from it, um, which can stand you in good stead forevermore, was not 
really my experience mm. of it. And it sounds like I've got this big chip on my shoulder, I suppose, but... You know, I don't think I have. I think what I want to be saying, why the reason I am sort of reflecting on it and saying it is because, look, we've got people with huge talents in my area. Um, you know, I'm thinking of people, I've, it's going through my mind, people who achieved, people who are incredibly impressive in their own field, you know, um, who have done really well, but they've had some good encouragement in the early years and I think that's what we need to emphasise as a a policy going forward in my view in terms of education I think people shouldn't be written off there shouldn't be this sort of thing where you know I think it's true to say that you know that the, the, the agenda of government in, in recent years has been to write off places like Hull well actually places like Hull are the wealth creators. We've got an experience with Siemens as an example where government should be emphasising the ability, we're at the gateway to Europe, we should be using the fact that there's a lot of people available and willing and enthusiastic, but they do need support from central government and sadly for the last 12 years that's not been forthcoming. Mm. It is interesting, it is interesting like, to say that. We've... Your, so when you like stopped all the, when you stopped that and then you thought, uh, we're gonna get on this plane and go to Australia. What was like the start through that then? You know, when you was like, right, yeah, this ain't going well for me. I ain't really learning much. I'm gonna do this. So like, what? How did you find out how to get to Australia? You know, well, like, yeah. So what it was really a pal of mine who stayed in Australia, James James Lambert. He's still there now. Um, you know, we were thinking what we're going to do. We we're sort of just turned 18 um, and we we're thinking going to Spain or somewhere like that. Um, but I started this sort of, you know, fairly big interest in rugby league, not ever expecting to be able to play the game because I was just not good, good enough. That was the truth of it, not to play at any sort of professional level. But I was still a, a, a rugby league fan and Australia is where the rugby league game is uh, is big really mm. um, so I fancied Sydney as a result of the rugby league and I went along I got a job in the uh, a pub in Parramatta the guy in charge of the booze I still remember him and I don't hear from him now but I did up to a few years ago a guy called Dave Wilson when I was interviewed for the for the job as a as a barman in the pub he said look this is it was called the Rose and Crown in Parramatta. It's still there now. And Dave Wilson said, "Look, this is the uh, this is the bloodbath of Parramatta. Will you be able to cope in a boozer in Parramatta where there's regularly these these scraps?" And I just been a glass collector from being a young kid, thirteen years of age at Salt House Tavern in East Hull. And in those days, it's different now, I'm sure, because I think attitudes has changed as well as everything else. But there was a there was a scrap in the pub every Friday night, at least. So, you know, the, my experience of being in a pub where it was sort of a rough estate boozer um, wasn't, you know, it wasn't off-putting mm. to be in what he described as the bloodbath of Parramatta. There was two fights in the pub in the 12 months that I was there and I started both of them <laughs> so the truth and, and I say it for a joke but actually that's not completely away from the truth so it was far from a bloodbath but they thought it was um, so yeah and I met uh, rugby league players who played for Parramatta who would come in on into the pub on the Thursday I got pally with a few of the players back in them days and um you know, kept my interest in rugby league in, in, in that I would go as a supporter, but not as, you know, I wasn't involved playing even at an amateur level then. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that was it. Australia, James stayed. Uh, I had sort of 12 months there. Uh, we'd booked our flights to come back, and on two or three days prior to us flying back, James said, I can't face it, I'm not, I'm not going back. Um, by then he was earning uh, really well, um, you know, twice what he'd be earning, earning in the UK, uh, and the the standard of living was better, and he was not prepared to sort of yeah sacrifice come it. home. He was staying there forever, and to be fair, he's brought his family up there, and 
you know, he's been incredibly successful. Um, uh, but he's somebody who really does work hard, and he got stuck in, and and he's done incredibly well, and I'm proud of him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but he, uh, you know, for me, it was I missed my mother. That was the truth. I was homesick. I mean, I'm not ashamed to say it. I would ring her up about every 20 minutes, and I remember the conversations with my dad, bless his cotton socks. Saying, put the phone down, he's reversed the charges. Will you <laughs> tell him to stop? He's reversed the charges again, put it down. Because I was missing my mother, was the truth of it. So there was no way I was going to stay forever. I just, you know what I mean? If I got an headache, I'd be ringing my mother saying, I'm, I've, I've got an headache, mother. And uh, she'd tell me to take two paracetamol, but because she'd said it, I felt better. Yeah. So I was a bit homesick, but came home and got interested in antiques, did that for a few years. And then went on to do what else I've spoke about. So with your year at the Australian, you said like the living's better over there. In what way do you mean about that? Like um, obviously like compared to like the UK and Hull and then Australia and where you was at. What was like so different where like Well it it wasn't better for me. All right. If I'm honest. It was better for James, but not for me. I was missing my mother, as I've said. So if your mum and dad if your mum and dad was like moved over, <laughs> That'd be all right with it, to be fair, but there was no prospects of my father and my mother moving out to me just because I was a bit homesick. But yeah, I mean the weather for a start is just you know, it's sunshine twenty four seven virtually. I mean it's just permanently nice. Um the standard of living, I can't remember what I was paid as a barman then, but it was quite a lot of money in comparison to what I'd be earning in Hull. Um, if I was guess, if I guessed, I would be guessing wrong, but it, it was probably at least two and a half times more what I'd be earning in a normal job in, in Hull, or even as a barman in Hull full time. It was a lot more than that, and James was a decorator, and he was earning... You know, he was just able to rapidly save up. Mm. Um, and the cost of living was not... I think the cost of living in Australia has gone up uh, quite a lot in recent years. But in them days, it hadn't quite yeah. yet. So this lifestyle, you know, we had a little Volkswagen Beetle, which we used to bomb around Sydney in with a roof down and, you know, going to be... You know, it was a good, good time for a year. But I didn't want to be there forever. James did. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when you came back, did you have like a job waiting for you, or did you come back and uh, like the world was like boisterous sort of thing? It was like, well, I sort of got I got an interest in antiques when I was in Australia, just by somebody who I knew uh, in the pub um, who would buy and sell antiques, and most of them would arrive in containers from the UK and be sold to the um, to the sort of the the uh, retail market actually normal sort of everyday everyday customers uh, from from auctions, and I'd sort of noticed this these bits of furniture which were coming from Britain, being sold for several hundred dollars in, in these auctions, and I'd think, well, you know, I'm, I might keep an eye on this and see what what it's like in the UK. And I came back, started going to a few auctions, and you know. To tell you a, an item so that you can have a flavour of what I mean. A barley twist gate leg table, sort of a 1930s oak table, would cost something like 18 quid in an auction, but it would sell in Australia for seven, eight hundred dollars. Yeah, my profit. So you'd be getting it stripped and polished and waxed and all the rest of it, and you'd get, instead of getting one, you'd try and buy 50 over a period of time, and then you'd get them on a container and send them out. Um, and, you know, I did reasonably well at it. Um, I didn't get rich by any stretch of the imagination, but I earned a good living, and I was my own gaffer. Um, But I think deep down I'd always had that burning ambition to be a lawyer. I'm not quite sure why, probably through parenting, actually. My father was a full-time trade union official for the National Union of Seamen. My mother was a, a nurse, and they were both union reps in their own right. And I'd often hear stories about my father being in an employment tribunal, but, you know, he'd be against some barrister, some sort of top barrister who was, you know, um, arguing the case for the employer, and my dad would be there on his own arguing the case for the employee, and I'd be sort of, I'd, I'd have that thing about wanting to be on the side of 
the employee and sticking up for the rights of the you know the people who are not you know not equally represented actually because you know the truth of it is i'm i encourage business and i'm keen on uh wealth creation but actually i think employment rights are incredibly important and the diminishing in today's society more and more not least after 12 years of a tory government employment rights are falling apart not least because of the fact that we left the european union and a lot of the employment rights came through the regulations that are associated with the uh, membership of the european union and you know I was keen to be on the side of the, the, the small person who was fighting against the world, if you like, and that's why I practised criminal law, um, because actually, you know, until you come against it, until you have an experience with the law, uh, whereby um, you find yourself in criminal prosecution, criminal proceedings, you know, it's very often for for some people, it's the first time they ever come against it, and they're on their own very much. And, you know, you're fighting the Crown Prosecution Service, which is well-resourced, um, and they need representation as well. And not everybody's guilty of criminal offences. A lot are, to be fair. I've represented some guilty people and I've rep represented some very innocent people. Um, and I think, you know, if you are accused of something, you should have the ability to get represented and it shouldn't cost you, mm. frankly. Um, the Crown bring a case against an individual, and it should be the Crown who have to prove it, which it is in law. Um, uh, but the individual shouldn't be the one who has to fund that to the point where they lose everything. Mm. And legal aid exists for that reason. It's part of the welfare state. It's something we should be proud of and we should be defending. You know, um, and... That was basically why I wanted to sort of work in crime. It's knackered now, to be honest with you. The criminal law is it's incredibly difficult now to get um, younger people coming into the criminal law profession because, frankly, it doesn't pay. Um, a criminal solicitor, as an example, newly qualified, would be starting on something like 22,000 quid in this area. Uh, compare that with a commercial solicitor in uh, Manchester, Leeds, uh, dare I say it, in London as much more, but even in Manchester or Leeds, or even in Hull, in fact, as a newly qualified commercial solicitor, the salary starts at something like 40, 50. If you get to London, you're looking at 70,000 plus even for a training contract. So, you know, people are not encouraged to go into the criminal law, which I think is a tragedy uh, because... It just it, it it reflects not just on the the the, the fact that uh, people from ordinary backgrounds are not going into it now. It's also about diversity. Black and ethnic minority people are avoiding the criminal laws of practice because, frankly, they tend to come from backgrounds, working class backgrounds, where it's difficult financially. Education's not cheap. Nine thousand quid a year for for every year of your degree and then i think the bar vocational course i don't think they call it that nowadays i can't remember what its new name is but that is probably about 16 to eighteen thousand quid the solicitor's course is probably about i'm guessing but probably 13 fifteen thousand quid it's always been a little bit less than the bar course but you know it's an expensive it's incredibly expensive. So when you've had all that investment into your legal education, do you go into criminal law, which don't pay? It never, you know, eventually might if you become a partner in a firm or if you do well as an independent practitioner at the bar, eventually you'll, you'll get a living, but it's incredibly difficult to get a living fast. Do you do that? because of interest and wanting to represent people who are up against it or do you go into a commercial law doing for example conveyancing mm. residential or commercial conveyancing which is pays a lot better um, and sadly that's what tends to be happening so like if you was a wanting to play, like, become a lawyer let's like, say like you know someone's in like a dead end job thinking uh, I want to like do something else 
what would you recommend them like starting? Let's say like they've got no qualifications, they've got nothing, and they're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm like 30, 40 years old now, being at this job for like 30 years, I want something different. Yeah. What would you like? What would you recommend for that individual to get into law? Yeah, yeah. And what what sort of like route would you tell him to go? Like you know, like you said, three diff- like four different styles there. Like yeah, the criminals. The I mean, it depends where they are in terms of their education. Um, uh, you can do you can, you can do a course now which removes the fact that you have to do a law degree, a qualifying degree. So you can do a twelve month course like that. I would just encourage people to just on the bullet and actually invest in themselves and go into if they want to get into the law uh, the, the, the law profession I would encourage it big time because it's incredibly rewarding I mean it's you know it's not easy especially in the criminal law it's definitely not easy but that feeling I mean some people say to me what's it like to sort of what was it like to be in parliament and asking I was at a school recently and the student said, what was it like asking Boris Johnson that question? What did it feel like? He was like really excited lad. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, because when he sat down, he said, I saw the expression on his face. He was really pissed off with you. I said, yeah, he was, yeah. <laughs> he said, what was it like to sort of, because you'd got him, hadn't you? He said, I said, it was, it's a good feeling when you get one on them because the idea of the game is to beat them and get them out of the government to get a Labour government in. It's a great feeling, but there's no better feeling for me, and I speak to other criminal lawyers about this, uh, when you come out of a courtroom, whether you're prosecuting or whether you're defending as a barrister, and the jury have delivered the verdict that you've been working to get, and it doesn't matter if you're defending... You know, you might have worked on a defence brief for some time and you get the result by the defendant being acquitted of serious criminal offences. The feeling's great. But if you're prosecuting that individual as well and you've worked on that brief, the jury come back and find them guilty. The feeling of sort of relief, the work you've put in, you know, all of that effort, that feeling of that full person of the jury standing up and saying guilty if you're prosecuting or not guilty when you're defending, there's no better feeling. Mm. It is sort of it's like winning the scoring the goal at Wembley. I would think if you're a you know a goal scorer at Wembley, <laughs> <laughs> so which I'm not. Sadly, <laughs> I wish I had been. So move on to like Hull College because I'm actually a student there as well. I Ew. love Hull College. What what was your experience like as a student? Well, look, it's a really important question, Josh, if you don't mind me mentioning. But it does bring me, I'm afraid to tell you, into the politics of stuff. Yeah, yeah, when yeah. I talked well, about Labour's... Yeah, well, look, Labour's too. lifelong <laughs> learning agenda, right, was about people like me. It was about people like me who'd failed at school, getting back into education and achieving. So I went off to Park Street College, old, old college, and did A-levels with people who were similar ages to me. 20-odd. Mm. You know, if I'd have been going off to a sort of a, a, a normal college where the guy and girl sat next to me is 16 years of age, frankly, I don't think I'd have lasted very long. Mm. Sadly, that doesn't exist anymore. And that's the result of government policy. And it's not necessarily direct government policy, but it's about colleges like Hull who are having to compete in a market where there's more... You know, there's more availability for places than there are students to fill them very often. Um, Not having the extra dosh to be able to put aside resource for those sort of potential students. So, and there was an emphasis from the Labour government on that. It was about getting people who mature, mature students, back into education and proving that they've actually got an ability where they can achieve. I mean, if you think about it... uh, when I went back to Hull College at, tw- I can't remember my age, honestly, 20 odd, you know, and sitting in a room with like similar people, people who were working for a living, who were doing it part time, who have got, f- very many of them had families. Uh, I didn't at the time, I do now, but, um, you know, you were with people who were similar to you. I think the idea of going into a college course now and being among 16-year-old people, I'd be like, I don't really fit. Mm. But there was an emphasis on that, sort of encouraging mature people into education under the previous Labour government's 
agenda on education. Um, so look, all college was was uh, for me my access into a life, and I sort of had a life anyway. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, uh, you know, the, the walking into that room back then to do do uh, law at A level and so on. The idea that I'd be waltzing into uh, the chamber of the House of Commons soon mm. after uh, was unlikely. And the truth of the matter is, look, if I'd have been the candidate, if I'd have been thrown behind, I don't, I don't mean to be disparaging about members of the Labour Party in East Hull because they're my, my gaffers, frankly. They decide whether I'm the candidate or not. But if I'd have been in that contest against other people... As somebody who was advertising himself as a prospective candidate for the Labour Party and hopefully going to be elected to Parliament, as a second-hand dealer or a lawyer, I'm afraid to tell you the reality is they wouldn't have chosen the second-hand dealer that have been choosing the lawyer. And that's just the reality of life, I think. So, all college gave me the, 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 the chance to go on to Hull University... And to do well, it was hard for me, by the way. I mean, it really was hard for me. I was in the library a lot, reading constantly, uh, reading and really trying, um, because I didn't find it easy. It's like, you you know, A-levels are difficult, and then you find that the degree's more difficult, and then you find that the bar course is more difficult still. But for me, I felt it was even harder because I was convinced, permanently convinced, kept telling myself I was never going to be able to pass exams. I'd be looking around the room thinking, God, he's clever. I didn't have a clue whether he was clever, but I'd be convinced he was a lot cleverer than me. Mm. And that is just, I think, sort of... I think it was just conditioning. Um, as I say, I don't criticise people. But it was very much. You have that sort of thing where you don't think you're capable of doing it. Um, I still dream now, actually. I still wake up now and again in the middle of the night and think, oh, I, 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 I hope I don't fail that exam. And then I sort of come round and remember I've already passed them. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got that in you. You've got that sort of conditioning that you can't do it. And first time I stood up in the House of Commons to ask a question, I think the, uh, well, it was, it was David Cameron, the first Prime Minister's question I asked... I remember standing up thinking, I've been cold, what do I do now? <laughs> this shouldn't be happening. You know, there's Cameron, and there's the Speaker, and I've been, he's, he's seen me and he's, he's asking me, and I'm thinking, what do I say? I ain't got a clue, and I spilled something out which sounded all right, probably a bit aggressive, because I tend to dislike Tories quite a lot. Um, I'm doing better at I'm doing better at that, but I don't <laughs> tend to. It, I tend to, to dislike them an awful lot, and it gets in the way of things sometimes. But I don't dislike any individual personally, by the way. Genuinely, I don't. But I just despise with a vengeance just the, belief. the politics of them because yeah, yeah, yeah. they're just truly about themselves and about you know prospering and getting on and doing them. You know, it's all about that, um, and it just makes me feel. Uh, incredibly unwell um, but I know Tories I've got people who are conservative voters who are good friends of mine um, and I'm sort of friendly to an extent with some Tory MPs um, uh, on a sort of you know on a level where I wouldn't go for a pint with them but I'd certainly talk to them in corridors but it's the politics of them that I just cannot stand mm. What did you find like the Politics of like Hull were like, you know, like uh, about like the trip, like treated the students and stuff. The politics within the university. Uh, well, we'll we'll go on the university after college, uh, but what was like college like, you know, like how like the treated and stuff like that? Because obviously they were used to like, you know, like the sixteen age. Because obviously yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm twenty five. Yeah, yeah. I feel like sometimes the treatment like yeah, yeah. a new student or the treatment like a sixteen. Yeah. Um. Well, I found it quite positive, yeah. if I'm honest. My lecturer, my law lecturer, was a woman called Jane Walker. She, I think she retired a few years ago, but she was just incredibly impressive and just, you know, desperate for you to get stuck in and learn. And 
as I say, I was, a, I was with mature students and I didn't really get involved in the politics of the college that much. Um, you know, I wasn't sort of leading a, you know, leading a campaign to oust a particular lecturer or anything like that. I know that it can be sometimes a bit militant in colleges with students. I didn't get involved in that politics of it, really. Okay. Um, I was just, if I'm honest, I was busy trying to earn a living, yeah, yeah. pay Studio a mortgage and, and study at the same time as earning a living and paying a mortgage. Um, so I kept my head down, probably. So was this, was this part-time, then? I did it part-time. Time. I did it um, over, uh, over a 12-month period. In them days, you could, because it was... I think it was the last year you'd be able to, to identify the date now, because it was the last year as the full A-level before it became AS-level, where you do, I think, the AS and then the A-level. In a two-year period, it was the last year of, of actual A-levels before that... AS thing came in um, so it was just it was hard graph for me because I didn't achieve at, you, at, at school as you know and um, you know uh, reading a book was, was not something I did much mm. and all of a sudden I'm reading several textbooks uh, a week uh, and, and having to sort of really really try hard um, but that that was good because it set me up for the degree, which was probably ten times harder than the air levels for me. So doing like that and work, then what was you doing on the side for work? I was uh, I was doing the work more than on the side. It was a full time job. I was actually doing the antiques business so antiques, whilst I was at college. And then you were doing a college. Yeah, and then, and then I gave up the antiques business when I was in the first year of the degree at Hull University. Yeah. So when the when you went on to the degree, yeah, what was the degree in? Law. Law. The LLB at Hull University. And how, how many years was that? Was that three? three. Three years. Yeah. So um, your first year, your freshers, what was that like? Well, it was. Uh, Did you participate in the fresher week? I didn't, to be honest. No. I, I sort of, I probably went to the sort of end of it. I mean, it lasts a week, doesn't it? Four oh, weeks. Horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember going into... I must have participated to an extent because I remember going into the uh, the main hall and, and seeing the Lib Dem uh, stand and the Conservative stand opposite one another and the Labour Party stand was missing. So I was cheesed off, but then I suddenly worked out that the Labour Party stand was in a different area, which was a better area, and the reality was everybody was at the Labour Party stand. So that cheered me up. I remember that uh, from Freshers' Week. Um, but to be honest, I was still sort of paying a mortgage um, and, you know, I was living independently and having to pay the bills. So is so, you have another job on the side? Like part well, I did antiques for about a year. Um, so you had enough to save up? Yeah, I did. And then I flogged, the, I flogged the house and there was a bit of equity in it, which sort of got me through to the second and third year. And actually got me through the bar vocational course, as it was called then, in Newcastle. Um, but the pressure, I think, it was it was a pressure as well because if you've got that thing where you think you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to pass the exams, you're not gonna get there, and you flogged your house and you're using the equity that you had in it, which wasn't a lot of money, about ten thousand quid, to live for that period. Um, you're thinking I've I've gambled everything, mm. you know. I might get a chance of a picture with a wig on, and a gown on, but actually nobody's going to want to have a bloke like me uh, working for them as a lawyer, you know. And actually, and that's even if what you know that'd be great if I ever get to that point. But actually, I'm not likely to pass because of that conditioning I've spoken about. Mm. Um. Uh, and that was a pressure. Um, so did you have like, a lot of self-doubt then? While you was going oh, total self-doubt. Absolute constant self-doubt. Um, I would be convinced I was going to fail. I would, you know, people would be revising three areas for an exam. I'd be revising every area possible, which was meant, meant that I was in the library 12 hours a day. Um, uh, and, you know, I'd... You know, when you've done an exam and you come out the exam, you know whether it's gone well or not. Because, the, you know, the questions that you preferred the most are there and you've answered the questions you prefer the most. Um, but even then I would be thinking, 
yeah, but I'll, I've got the wrong end of the stick with that question, and I've got it wrong, and I'm, I think, you know, it was that just self-doubt, and I think that even when you do well, and you I did well in the first year, and then did well in the second year, and then in the third year I was sort of looking towards probably a first, um, and, you know, the pressure I think I put on myself meant that I just fell slightly. I think I got an average about 69 just over, you know, it was just below the seventy, um, and it was they didn't build it, they, they didn't bring it up into a first because I think the second year there was something about the second year falling below a two one in one of the modules, which meant they couldn't boost it to a first for whatever reason. <laughs> but yeah, I never expected to get do as well as that. I was convinced I was a fail. Um, what did you pass with? I got a two one, but an average of sixty nine percent, which was top end. It was like almost there, yeah, yeah. Um, which was gobsmacking to me. And then on the bar course as well, you know, I went on that, and for the full twelve months, was convinced I was never going to pass. And then did well again. I got uh, uh, an outstanding from oh, wow. from that, um, and you know. Um, surprisingly to me uh, so yeah it, you know there's a lot to be said for sort of you know being being um, you know not allowing those demons to take over and, and being confident yeah 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 and it's nice it's nice to hear it's like sort of thing because obviously from like day one it's like people like told you as well like you'll never make it as well like with like the careers teacher who like laughed at you and was like hurt on not really, if I'm honest. Um, no, certainly not in terms of lecturers or anything, or even friends socially. Never said you'll never make it, but it was about me thinking I wouldn't. Right, so it was just your self Yeah, I think my dad was like, "What do you want to do? What do you want to go off to university for when you, you know, you're doing all right?" And I think that's just sort of working class thing. Why are you risking? I mean, he didn't, he didn't discourage me. He didn't say don't do it, but he was like. I probably reflecting on it, it was probably unenthusiastic. Mm. Um, uh, but yeah, nobody said you won't you won't pass. Don't don't waste your time. Um, so I got encouraged. I was encouraged uh, certainly by the uh, academics uh, on the law degree, um, and I still I'm still friends with with lecturers now. Um, one of the people who was a massive inspiration to me is a guy called Deverell Caps and he's he was in charge of the the um, uh, advocacy module at Bar School at Northumbria and I'm still pals with Dev now he's now in charge of the Leeds Beckett University where I'm a visiting fellow so I go and lecture at Leeds Beckett now and again and I sometimes wow. stand in there and think you know um, I'm actually lecturing the kids that I was once one of a low mm. undergraduate uh, and I can't believe I'm here telling them how to do it when I used to be one of them thinking I was never going to do it you know so that's things like that sometimes you think wow that's a bit weird mm. so no it's good did you ever participate in like any of the um, union stuff like for the societies or the sports clubs and stuff like that because you said you was interested in like the I, to be honest I didn't stuff. really and I mean I was I was you know I was a mature student and um, you know I didn't fancy getting filled in on the, the, the rugby field if I'm honest with you by some 18 year old giant who was desperate to give me a good hard in yeah, yeah. I was a bit windy getting filled in to be fair I'm not keen on getting my head smashed in I'm a bit funny about things like that, so I didn't really know. Um, I did sort of socialise with with other fellow travellers, um, and occasionally got on the on the uh, booze. Um, but I think university for me wasn't about the social thing. It was oh, yeah. about determination to get something under my belt and get on with it. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't really spend much time in the union boozing. Occasionally, maybe, but not much. I was too too worried about getting back to the library and getting stuck in. Um, but I would participate in mooting 
sort of advocacy events. So you sort of you have a mock courtroom and pretend to be cross examining a bent lying copper, for really? example, and you'd get actors coming in who play the part of a bent lying copper or a defendant who was telling lies or whatever and you would sort of participate in that mock courtroom scenario and I did plenty of that because I was interested in learning the art of advocacy and that's what it is really, it is an art it's not It's not something, I mean it's something that can be taught advocacy to a standard but the ones who are brilliant at it are uh, instinctively good at it I think it's fair to say Yeah, 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 that's good Good. So, before, because uh, we're looking at the time, I will fire one question over. Um, which just put to me, one of my uh, friends was like talking about it. He was saying, like, if you, you was, had the chance to meet what what law would you invent if you could make, like, a law? Yeah, um, it's, always a, it's always a good question. And the truth of that, Josh, is there's too many issues going on in the world and in society more locally. Um, that are desperately needing change for me to pick one. Mm. But I think if, uh, from my interest as a criminal practitioner, it would be probably around road traffic law. Right. Because I do tend to think that the... the, the, the I'm not an hang it, uh, hang and flog it, flog and merchant, by the way, but I do tend to think there are some lacunae in the law around road traffic offences. I did a private member's bill when I was early on in my parliamentary career and I changed the law in dangerous driving to include a new provision which was effectively causing serious harm by dangerous driving. Prior to that, the maximum sentence for you know, smashing a car or any motor vehicle into a, an individual or a family in a car at, at massive speed, recklessly and, you know, criminally, um, the maximum sentence for that was, if you didn't kill them, was two years. And I prosecuted a n- number of cases at, uh, at the bar uh, where... I, I thought that the, the, the sentence was far too lenient. Or if I was defending, you'd stand up in front of the judge and you'd begin your mitigation. Your Honour, the defendant is 21 years of age, he's not previously been in trouble, blah, 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 and you'd go on in the mitigation and the judge would just be looking incredibly frustrated at you because the victims of that terrible, terrible crime, lives are ruined. Mm. You know, literally... You know, literally, uh, their entire life has changed as a result of that reckless, mad act of driving like a raving mad person for a prolonged period and smashing into them with what is effectively a weapon, really. And uh, you would do your best to mitigate and the judge would be looking as if to say, look, the maximum I can give is two years. They've pled guilty, so I've got to give a third off. They've never been in bother, so I've got to reduce the fact that they're not a regular criminal offender and if they have been in trouble with the police, the offences that they've been convicted or pled guilty to are not similar, so there'd be some more off for that. And they'd very often end up with a non-custodial sentence, but the actual victims of that offence are disabled forever and on the occasion I'm thinking I'd spent something like uh, about 18 months in hospital in a you know in a very in a state where it was very much touch and go so the private members bill became a, a, a provision in the Road Traffic Act through the Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act, so it actually is an offence now, causing serious injury by dangerous driving, and the maximum sentence for that now is five years, um, which is, I think, about right. Um, so I think I would do something probably around road traffic um, if I got the chance to make a, a particular law, but 
there's more burning, more important issues. Mm. There's child poverty. The fact that we've got a situation where kids are going to school without grubbing the belly. Mm. You know, that's more important to me, if I'm being honest. The fact that we have a very unequal society. The fact that the government have been promising to do away with Section 21 no fault evictions, you know that how that works. This is yeah, sort of yeah. somebody's a tenant of a property. They've never put a foot wrong. They've been a tenant for a prolonged period. They've always paid the rent. All of a sudden, the landlord, for whatever reason, wants them out, probably to sell the property. I get it. I get. I understand. But they can be turfed out without any fault at the spare of the moment. At Section Twenty One allows them to give a two-month period of notice and then the courts are looking to physically have them removed by bailiffs. That's about, in my view, grossly unfair. Um, uh, you know, if it's a private homeowner, somebody buying their home, even if you default on your mortgage, there's a mechanism and a period where you're given some grace and you're given some support by the the, 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 the mortgage lender... You know, these are people who've done that wrong, mm. who are being turfed out, and their entire family being turfed out for doing nothing wrong. So that's another example where I'd want the government to legislate to, to a ban uh, no fault uh, evictions. Um, you know, zero hour contracts. You know, yeah. people say, look, these are so people quite like them. Well, frankly, I don't know anybody who does. Like them, I don't think having uh, a situation whereby your obligations to the employer are uh, so demanding that the obligations coming from the employer in that contractual situation are nothing like mirrored. You get a text message, you're expecting to go and start a shift at two o'clock this afternoon, you get a text message at three minutes to two saying you're not needed today. Mm. What are you supposed to do with your time then when you've got four hours planned where you're going to earn 10 quid an hour or whatever, probably less, frankly, but around 10 quid an hour. And that 10 quid an hour for that four hour shift is going to be the difference between eating that week. So those are the types of things that I think need urgent legislative attention, which, frankly, only a Labour government is going to provide. I think the biggest one is Domino's for that, you know. Yeah, I used to be a delivery, a delivery driver. Yeah. Um, and they'd be like, oh, come for four hours, you get there, an hour into your shift, they'd be like, oh, we don't need you now, it's, it's not yeah. busy enough. No, it's, it's outrageous. I mean, I ought to say, given that I'm a lawyer, um, I'm, I'm always a bit nervous about libeling commercial entities, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Domino's are not here to give their side of the version, but no, Domino's is not uh, you know, is not specific. It's not specific to Domino's. It's, yeah. you know, it's that sort of gig economy stuff, isn't it? Where people are just treated badly. Yeah. Actually, you know, really just treated badly. They don't have employment rights. They can't plan ahead. They don't know what they're going to earn at the end of the week or month. And their employers have sort of got whip hand over them. And if they don't like it, there's plenty of people who are prepared to do that crap job. Yeah. And that is the problem we have, which we need to address big time, in my view. There's loads more of it, by the way. You know, you know, uh, just, you know, mental health. It, it, the, the mental health is a poor relative of, of, of general health in the National Health Service physical health you know mental health you know is crippling if you suffer with poor mental health and actually suicide rates are, 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 are tragically increasing uh, not least as a result of the 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 what's happening in the economy with the cost of living yeah but like crisis i had like and, a conversation with my uh, parents family and they were like saying uh my bill has gone up from, I think it was like 1,200 to like 2,300 Yeah. a year. So like, and then his like mortgages keep on going up by like 70 pounds, like they fluctuate so much. Yeah. So he was like, if it gets any longer, like we'll be just sat on the surf in the dark. No, it's frightening actually for people, 
uh, on an individual basis, and I just sort of we've got to we've got to be fairer, and we've got to equalise things a bit, and we've got to. And the reality is, it's you know I'm bound to be party political, but the actual truth is, you know, only a Labour government will address those inequalities in society to level them up. Mm. The Tories will never ever look at doing that work because frankly it doesn't suit them. That's the truth. What's your I don't want to get in political but oh, I do want to know here. What, what do you think about the, the Green the Green Party? What's well, your views and thoughts around them? Because uh, a lot of mixed emotions. Look, I mean look the Green Party fine, but the reality is they'll not thank me for it. Um but you know, you vote Green, get Tory. That's the reality of our electoral system. We have a first past the post system, so if I'm the candidate in Eastall at the next election, and people are minded to vote Green, you're helping the Tories win that seat. That's just the truth. Do I disagree with any of the policy agenda of the Greens? Not really. Probably not on anything. I can't remember what they say on other general things, but probably I'd, I'd be unlikely to disagree with the policy agenda. Is the Labour government, is the Labour Party's agenda up to the Greens? Yeah, actually, it is. If you look closely, the Labour Party are out greening the Greens. If you look at our policy on the issues that matter, so you know, I would encourage people not to waste the the opportunity of retaining a Labour MP and voting to elect a Labour MP because it's critical that people go out and vote and. Uh, get this terrible Tory government out of power. Twelve years of failure, failure on the economy, failure on every area, failure in the NHS, failure in the justice system. You've got a situation in the justice system whereby it's virtually impossible to be represented in family law proceedings unless you've got a really good job. And that shouldn't be the case. I'm not suggesting that the Chancellor of the Exchequer, when we win an election, is going to start pumping multi-millions into that, those departments because the tragedy is there's other priorities. And actually, we're going to be inheriting a terrible mess when we win the next election. So we've got to be honest about what, we can, what we're going to be able to afford to do. Mm. But actually, the fact that we genuinely want to do and improve stuff for people is an important thing, in my view. And it's frustrating. It is frustrating. And we may not be saying enough on this issue or enough on that issue. But actually, getting into government is a very important thing. And it brings me to sort of, I think, you know, one of the political quotes. It's not, you know, it's not one that's really famous. But Tony Blair, actually used to say, I didn't get into politics to change the Labour Party, I got into politics to change the country mm. you know, and I think that's important, you've got to want to make a difference and I genuinely know with Keir Starmer he's a man who works unbelievable hours, he's committed and determined to get rid of this Tory government and he's somebody who I'm impressed by, terribly impressed by on a personal level, actually, certainly not boring in my experience, um, uh, but on a professional level as well, he is determined to get rid of this Tory government, and he'll work every hour and every minute to ensure that we do just that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll have one more, one last question before we make a wrap. Um, you touched on it a little bit, like saying, like, uh, you yeah, have a good job and stuff like that. In your views, what do you think like a job a good job is? And with obviously like the increase of living, what wage would you think is comfortable? Because obviously, like I thought, like a twenty five grand wage would be comfortable, but it's like it's not. It just pays the bill, and that's it. What do you think like a good job is? There's two points to that. I think. I mean, a good job is a job that you want to do. Mm. Frankly, a job that's rewarding. Um, uh, you know, the most rewarding job uh, probably is helping people really and you know we have a situation where our carers in social care are treated terribly by society people just look down what do you do for a living I'm a carer you know we're clapping them on the doorsteps during the pandemic and then we say well they don't deserve 
a reasonable amount of money to be able to live on. Mm -hmm. That is a terrible, terrible, damning, damning indictment of a government who have been clapping them on the doorstep and then saying, frankly, you know, you can whistle for if, uh, if you want to have a decent standard of living. Um, I'm not going to sort of say to you now on a podcast interview, which is going to be broadcast, <laughs> it should be 325 quid an hour or something like that, because before I even leave, if it's going out live... Uh, Keir Starmer will be messaging me or somebody from his office will say what on earth are you talking about you idiot behave yourself <laughs> and go back in there and take it back look look. the truth is this uh, the trade union congress is saying that 15 quid an hour is the minute should be the minimum I don't disagree with that is the Labour Party committed to 15 quid an hour no we're not we're not because it's not just a case of saying yeah that's it that's do. The reality is that 15 quid an hour commitment from the Trade Union Congress was months ago. Things have got changed since then vastly. We've got the cost of living crisis. Inflation's running at about, what, 10.1%. Um, it's probably not enough, being honest. Uh, but we have to be realistic as well. I've got a constituency business who are in the care profession who are caring for uh, people with severe, moderate and severe learning disabilities, daily respite and indeed overnight respite. But you know, if I was to say to that organisation it's going to have to be 25 quid an hour in a few months, that would bankrupt that business. So you cannot be sort of, you know, you, 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 you can't be flippant. Mm -hmm. uh, about these things you have to look at it carefully and be carefully considered but the reality is people don't get paid enough mm. people shouldn't be getting up in a morning getting on the push bike or getting on the bus or whatever else it is the mode of transport going to graft grafting grafting five six days a week having very little time with the families and not earning enough to live on. Mm. That is a shocking situation that the country is now facing and the government need to act. And the idea that this Tory government is going to do anything to help people who get out of bed in the morning and go and graft for a living is just utterly nonsensical. It's not going to happen. You need a Labour government. Mm -hmm. I'll keep it from there. I've got loads more questions. Uh, thank you for being on the Big Wig State talk show. It hopes they have you back again. Yeah. Go through all the, the next stages, because I believe yeah. we've missed quite a lot. It's a great one, title, by the way, Big Wig. Is it Big Wig? Big Wig Photographer? So that's my uh, photography brand. Right, brilliant. And the podcast will be called Date Talk Show. Yeah, your barnet, Josh, looks like my barrister's wig, <laughs> but it's a bit of a different colour. I could I could literally grab that and get away with it in court. <laughs> so next time you're on the podcast, I want you to bring you... I'll bring the wig. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there it is, thank you. Thanks, Josh. For Labour. <laughs> but. But. Bah. 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 Bah.